Washing Wayne's hair, 1947. Wash day at the pool's house could mean one of two things. Time to wash clothes or time to wash my brother Wayne's hair. In either case, it was a family chore which required family-wide participation. The family as a group did the clothes because that was fair. Washing Wayne's hair was done by the family because it required the collective cunning and strength of the whole family to get it done. Wayne was born hating water. He didn't seem to mind drinking it. He just had this thing about putting his head down in it. When we lived at Wilton, Arkansas in the 40s, we had most of the better things life had to offer. We had the shared experiences born of big family togetherness. We had extra quilts on cold nights because mama found time to make them for us. And we had the delightful prospect of the occasional roll of funny papers tossed to us by a revered railroad man who waved to us from the caboose of the train that passed our house daily. One of the things we didn't have was running water. If we'd had it then, maybe Wayne wouldn't have, would have taken to water more readily. He might have been trusted to wash his hair himself, thus saving untold grief borne by many a pool who had the untimeliness to be available when it was time for Wayne to be shampooed. The problem was simple enough when stated, get Wayne down to Lick Creek and shampoo his hair. Pretty simple, all right. It was Saturday morning. Wayne was still asleep and plans were already in progress to arrange a pond dunking. Mama had already wo woken Jay, Janice, Wilma, and Wesley. Daddy was working, so he was excused from duty. Mama delayed waking Richard and I for fear of waking up Wayne prematurely. The three of us shared the same bed. Everyone was receiving their orders, half whispered and half hand signaled from Mama. Wilma and Janice would attend to the soap, rags, scrub brushes, towels, and buckets. Jay and Wesley would stand guard at the bedroom door in case Wayne attempted a getaway. Mama, always a planner for every contingency, had already checked with Mr. Messamore and was assured that none of his cows would be in the area near Lick Creek at the appointed time. Mr. Messamore wasn't a, wasn't a fool. It only took one, one Wayne washing earlier to convince him it was in his best advantage to keep his meager herd of cows away from the inevitable fracas soon to visit his pond. The last time he failed to remove his cows when Wayne was brought to the creek, they not only refused to give milk, they also bellowed and cried so pitifully, his chickens began an immediate production shutdown of their own. His pet goat, Barbara, was distraught. She OD'd on corn mash and was last seen chasing cars on the Ashdown Highway. Each soldier had his or her orders and was positioned at their respective post, waiting for General Mama to signal the beginning of the police action. Mama pointed at Jay and motioned for him to close in slowly. Janice and Wilma were already making their way to the creek, carrying the gear necessary to the mission. Jay moved as quietly as our old cat, Stoink, when he was stalking an unsuspecting sparrow. Step by easy step, Jay crept toward the sleeping threesome, testing each board for squeaks as he went. One more step and he would be close enough to take the much smaller Wayne in his grasp. One more step and the frightening mad dash to the creek would begin. Jay brought his foot down to complete the final step. As before, he tested the boards under him to make sure they didn't betray his presence. Boards okay? As a matter of fact, he thought to himself, the boards seemed extra quiet in that spot. As he put his full weight down and reached forward to snare his victim, the perfect plan exploded into failure with a blood-curdling squall of protest from Stoink, who suddenly found his tail anchored to the floor by Jay's bare foot. Jay's attention was momentarily directed toward the cat and was in the process of making quilt scraps out of his pant leg. Jay lifted the offending foot just in time for Stoink to get off one more parting scratch. Stoink leaped against the wall beside the bed, did a back flip double gainer off the wall, and bounded across the bed using a very surprised Wayne as a stepping stool on his way to the door and eventual freedom from cattail stompers. Wayne's reaction was just as quick as Stoink's. He knew immediately what was about to happen. As nonchalantly as he could crawl over me, to the free side of the bed, he cautiously slipped on his pants, 
As Jay began easing around the bed toward him, Wayne's eyes darted about the room. Wesley at the door. No way out. He could go under the bed, but they would eventually smoke him out. The only way out was the window, and Wayne knew something about the window Wesley and Jay did not. They knew that one of the lower panels had been replaced with a pillow, but they did not know Wayne could pass through the hole without so much as touching the remnants of sun-powdered putty that remained. Wayne finishing, finished buttoning his pants as he mentally measured the distance between him, the window, and Jay. Going through the window on the run would be something new for Wayne. He had done it before just to show Leon Warren and Scotty Hedgecock that he could do it. This time, things had more of an air of urgency about them. Jay failed to recognize Wayne's plan. He called to Mama and Wesley to approach and end it all. Only Wesley came. Taking care not to spook the trapped object of their hunt, they closed in slowly. On some silent cue, as though orchestrated from off stage, the hunters and the hunted in unison made their move. Wesley and Jay collided in midair over the spot previously occupied by Wayne. Wayne sailed like a paper airplane, headlong into the pillow-stuffed window. He remained airborne only briefly before coming to rest outside the house in the waiting arms of Mama. You don't raise seven kids without learning a little about human nature. Bruised and confused, Jay and Wesley scrambled to get outside. Richard and I caught sight of the group about halfway to the creek. He had not known the way to the creek. We could have easily found it by following the trail of dust that drifted in the wake of the other telltale signs. Signs such as freshly broken tree limbs, clawed rocks, soil newly turned by the dug-in fingers and toes of a desperate small boy facing the most terrifying experience imagined. As we climbed the steep bank that formed the creek, we could hear the thrashing, splashing, and screaming, which meant Wayne was nearby and everybody near him was getting wet. We reached the top of the creek bank and witnessed the scene below. Mama was standing in knee-deep water and had a fearsome headlock on Wayne with one arm and was splashing water on his head with the other. There was little need to splash water since Wayne was doing plenty of that on his own. Jay was standing by, the sa by at a safe distance with shampoo. For reasons of family pride, no distinction is made here between lye soap and shampoo. Wesley was a better fisherman than a swimmer, so he positioned himself near the bank with a long cane pole, presumably to be used to retrieve any unlucky participants who might catch a flying fist or skinny elbow and suddenly find themselves studying the finned fauna in the bottom of Lick Creek. The rinse cycle was now approaching and it was clear that Wayne's bite was being rinsed away along with the last bubbles. Just as he had fought her so fiercely on the way to this debacle, he now clung to Mama as his protector now that it was over. No one dared ever make fun of his fear of water because hell hath no fury like a mama messed with in the process of mama. Wayne finally conquered his fear of water to the everlasting glee of all those forced to participate in his early bath training. He conquered it so well, in fact, that he became a lifeguard in his late teens just to be near the water on a full-time basis.